Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, both to the, our in-person audience and our extensive online audience. Um, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'd like to welcome you all to the January edition of our Ag Sector Council seminar series. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Ag Sector Council is a monthly seminar put on by the Bureau for Food Security um, and the Feed the Future Initiative. And, um, put on by our agri or knowledge driven agricultural development mechanism, um, our excellent team who is mostly there in the back running the webinar. Uh, we are always happy to uh, focus on events that are of high relevance to our ag development practitioners, food security practitioners, our missions, and we're always open for new ideas. So um, my email will be at the end of this presentation. If you have suggestions for future topics, highly uh, pressing topics that you think would be good for this series, feel free to bring them to me. Uh, for this particular seminar, we wanted to focus on soils because 2015 is the International Year of Soils. And our agrolinks.org platform is going to be um, putting out a whole range of blog posts, uh, events, and resources on the soils topic. And if you're on our agrolinks mailing list, uh, you will get notified of those. So we have a lot to delve into today, so we'll get started in just a moment. I always like to remind people to please turn off your cell phones or silence them so that we don't interrupt the speakers. Also, just to let you know, this seminar is being recorded uh, for our online audience and for a uh, resource that we'll post on agrolinks.org. Um, partly because it's being recorded and partly for our online audience, when you ask a question, um, we'd like to pass the microphone around to you. Uh, so generally, please hold your questions until the end of the seminar, although if you have a burning clarification question, uh, do feel free to raise your hand and we'll make sure to pass you a mic. And um, let's see, I think that that is about all for our housekeeping issues. So to introduce our speakers and to just give a very brief introduction to the soils topic, I'd like to pass the mic to Jerry Glover, who is an agricultural ecologist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security on our research team. Jerry? Thank you. Good morning. And um, happy International Year of Soils. It's uh, great. As my background's primarily in soil science, so it's great to see the focus on soils. And in our uh, research work, our development work in, in Africa, uh, particularly in Africa, but also in Asia, many of the biggest challenges we face are around soils. Uh, a lot of people don't really internalize the idea that when we're building flesh and bones and tissue of humans and animals, those nutrients magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, come from the soil. And farmers trying to get those nutrients concentrated into plants and in a, a form that we can uh, eat and consume and, and grow and be healthy is pretty challenging, especially in these uh, challenging soils that we find in, in many parts of Africa and some parts of Asia. So it was great to see these two gentlemen come in to talk about the difficulties that farmers often have in adopting best management practices for soils when they're also trying to, at least in the short term, produce the highest yields, get great economic returns without diverting too much of their resources to building the soil. But of course, long-term soil is very important. So there's often at least the appearance of trade-offs between the long-term soil health and short-term economic returns, uh, short-term yields. So to to, to look at those trade-offs and discuss the complexities of it, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ephraim Kanya from the International Food Policy Research Institute. He's a senior research fellow there. He's done a lot of work on the economics of land degradation, both in Africa and Asia. He's worked on several USAID projects, so he's pretty familiar with our development community. Uh, and then, of course, Dr. Keith Moore, who m many of you may know from Virginia Tech and his long-standing work with the Sustainable Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, CRISP, which is now the Innovation Lab. Uh, Keith uh, did a lot of work on that. And actually, just to highlight some of his work, uh, he had he's the author of this wonderful piece, The Sciences and Art of Adaptive Management. Looking at some of these uh, trade-off issues and, and the behavior change necessary in smallholder households, uh, I will also say Keith is now the ex uh, executive director of the Office of International Research, Education, and Development there at 
Virginia Tech. So he oversees, helps manage, coordinate uh, the various international programs, uh, some of which are funded by USAID. Uh, so his work is very re relevant. As uh, So with that, I'll open it up for uh, Keith Moore. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. Uh, I, I need to make a clarification um, in the interest of uh, uh, proper advertising and all. I, I'm not the author of the book. I'm the editor. Oh, sorry. And, and that, is a, that is an important issue because it takes all of us working together to solve problems. And uh, uh, we'll probably come back to that topic later um, as we move through this. Let's see what we got on these. Uh... Oh, that's me. <laughs> ah, that's Ephraim. <laughs> that's the title of um, uh, the presentation, Technological Change in Soil Management Practice. Uh, practices, Context and Innovation. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's based on a 30-year review of literature and observation of the uptake of soil management practices. Um, Agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa has been strained by degraded soils, limiting the, act to the productivity of small, farmer, um, small farmers who manage that land. Various practices have been suggested to improve soil fertility. Yet despite the potential for soil management technologies to improve soil fertility, studies examining the uptake of these technologies have demonstrated no universally predictive in uh, factors influencing adoption. So we, we just don't know what, what the silver bullet is. Um, integrated soil fertility management is a framework to understand and promote improved practices which will maintain sustainability and improve production. It's defined by Van Lau as a set of soil fertility management practices that necessarily include the use of fertilizer, organic inputs, improved germplasm combined with knowledge on how to adapt these practices to local conditions, aiming at maximum agronomic use efficiency of the applied nutrients, and improving crop productivity. All inputs need to be managed following sound agronomic principles. Um, there, there are different parts to this definition that, that, that are worth noting. One is the, the, the underlining of the significance of local conditions and local context um, and the re need for adaptation. Um, also, integrated soil management for uh, fertility management is not a simple technology, it's a complex one. And we'll come back to that complexity thing later. <laughs> Uh, the other part of this definition stresses the uh, scientific nature of the practices. Okay, so our objectives. How can we better understand what drives small farmer decision making? How can we leverage that understanding to foster innovation in agricultural practices? That's where, where we're going to go today. We're going to do this in two phases. First, in order to better understand farmer decision making, um, I'll analytically distinguish between two phases the process of agricultural innovation leading to changes in soil management. The first phase is framing the problem, specifying its context and the consequent choices then that small farmers face. The uh, second phase will address the consequent farmer decision making processes with respect the innovation, diffusion, and technological change. Um, okay, after um, we're going to frame the problem here in, in the first phase. Uh, we're going to talk about differences in perception about what soil fertility is and means to the different actors, primarily those, those uh, scientists and extension agents and the farmers. Um, we're going to uh, take a look quickly at uh, some economic factors affecting the smallholder enterprises, and then discuss a bit about um, faith-based framings of agricultural knowledge. Um, after framing the problem, I'll turn the floor over to Efren 
who will provide some concrete examples of the adoption of soil management practices, and then later I'll come back and discuss the paradigm um, or the changing paradigm of adoption, adaptation, and innovation. Um, and then we can discuss the, the implications for scaling up improved soil management practices. <laughs> Okay, farmer knowledge and perception of soil health and soil fertility often differs from that of research scientists and extension agents. While scientists measure soil fertility through chemical analyses, farmers rely on visual assessment of crop performance. Um, through chemical analyses, um, farmers rely on visual assessment of crop performance um, based on yield. Scientists are looking at, at the chemicals, the, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, um, the manganese, and all those chemicals that Jerry mentioned that I can't keep track of, I'm sorry. Um, and neither can the farmer, because they're looking at the output, the yield, um, and, and the, uh, uh, the color of the soil, the presence of weeds. Scientists and farmers have different objectives. While scientists focus, focus on maximizing soil quality for improved production, farmers seek to optimize soil use in trade-offs with other livelihood priorities. This all leads to very different perspectives when scientists and farmers meet to discuss soil fertility. Um, agricultural scientists and extension agents frequently blame the practices of smallholders for the degradation that occurs. Uh, and indeed, many adoption studies perceive a choice between the traditional, perceived as in, uh, a, an inferior technology, and the innovation, which is perceived as the superior technology, um, universal. On the other hand, farmers feel their insight, insights and their knowledge ignored in the process. Um, scientists and farmers, nevertheless, have the potential to enrich one another's knowledge of soil fertility and improve the capacity for innovation. Um, but there are many challenges, as you can see, in this confrontation of, of uh, perspectives to competent communication. Okay, the economic context. Small farmers are operating, small holdings, which are mixed production and consumption units. Farmers' economic framing of choices is driven by their perception of financial outcome, income stability, and food security. Agricultural outputs are only a part of their economic concerns. The farm household's consumption and production activities are inseparable. Off-farm income is often necessary to supplement income and in food from farm production. This and other forms of diversification are measures to protect against livelihood risk. Investment trade-offs are significantly more complex in a mixed production consumption unit than in farm and viewed as purely a production unit. This creates uncertainty as to the validity of economic econometric analyses, which view the farm as purely production unit. And there's, there is growing, but still insufficient research which examines the farm household through this mixed production consumption lens. Finally, I'd like to take a look for a moment at the role of faith-based knowledge. The adoption of innovations is more than simply a matter of how knowledge is produced and validated in the biophysical and economic dimensions. It also involves farmers' broader attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Spiritual, and religious beliefs within the community significantly, significantly shape how choices are framed. A person's <coughs> religious belief helps frame a worldview that influences farm management decisions and perceptions of agricultural problems. The promotion of conservation in agriculture has tapped into this. Faith-based organizations, international donors, and non-governmental organizations have been at the forefront of promoting conservation agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa, utilizing the Judeo-Christian ethic of environmental stewardship, citing biblical texts that place emphasis on caring for God's creation. Um, 
In fact, the, the, the example of Zimbabwe is rather interesting. The, the moldboard plow, in fact, was first introduced as, as, as something of, uh, to the Christian community, as, as an improvement and, and a, a matter of, of promoting um, the, the, the Christian faith in the country. It's linked together in the process. But by contrast, uh, an, an ex-tobacco farmer who became a convert to Christianity in, in uh, Zimbabwe developed um, conservation pra agricultural practices um, based on a revelation he had. Um, he noted that in, in the world of uh, on the natural world, there's no natural process that, that turns over the soil. That that's a purely artificial thing. So that, that the natural process was to have a bed of leaves and branches and um, grasses to, to cover the soil and protect it, which he called God's blanket. Um, and that has been the basis for a good deal of promotion of, of uh, conservation agriculture across southern Africa. Um, some of these practices have been adopted in situations where they were not agriculturally sound. But that's the, the point is that the religious faith and the tying in with it, the group nature of that, um, can be very powerful um, in terms of scaling up adoption. Traditional beliefs also are an important frame of reference for agricultural decision making. Okay, so what have we learned so far here? Farmers and scientists see the world differently with different lenses and different objectives. Economic factors shaping integrated soil fertility management choices extend beyond the field and farm to include complex farm household livelihood systems. And finally, ideologies and religions can be mobilized to help frame integrated soil fertility management choices. Um, decision making cannot be isolated from its context. So I'd like to, to stop here, remembering we tried to set a context um, and let uh, Efren take over for, for a while. Um, I'll pass you the baton. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm from a nomadic society, so I'm going to be down. <laughs> 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 uh, well, what I as a farmer, uh, Keith has done a very good job. But then, what, why is it important? The best thing is, it could reduce the use of all new organic fertilizers, which can have environmental. Make sure it's done. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. That it can help to adapt to climate change, but it's using the uh, climate related risk. Very good. So let me let me show that we, we compare the ISFM where there is a, a combination of uh, 
inorganic inputs, uh, organic inputs and inorganic inputs. And then we looked at the variance of yields over time. And the first one, this was a study in Uganda, and uh, this is a cross-section. We looked at the, the farmers, the ones who are combining and the ones who are not, and the ones who are just using inorganic fertilizer. But you can see the graph is good. It's telling you that uh, this is a log, uh, okay, okay. log of yield, which is the, the, the strong line, this one. It first uh, declines as uh, this is the log of carbon, soil carbon. Look, it declines and then it climbs up, which is good. We need higher yields. Look at the risks. First of all, it, in, it increases, then it goes down. So somebody who has uh, carbon at this level has both higher yields and lower risks, which is good. Now let's go to this. This was the this simulation, this such simulation model. And we looked at different managing practices from the one which is 100 crop residues are retained in the, in the plot. And then this one, manure, 1.7 tons and 50% of crop residues are retained, and so on and so forth. As you go from left to right, the risk is declining. And this was a 30-year period of simulation, telling you that if you have more carbon in the soil, the yield uh, risks are reducing. And the, all those climate-related risks, which are very frequent, in, especially in dry areas, that, that's something which is good. Um, now, we... You, we also look at the ISFM over a long period of time. Again, 30 years, this was a simulation where the farmers are not applying anything over the 30-year period. The yields are, are changed. Uh, it declined by over quite, quite a lot. But as you increase the crop residues and manure, and this is manure, it is not showing, but manure plus the fertilizer here, you see that it's sustainable over a long period of time. The yields are not declining. Again, this is good news for ISFM that it increases yield. It also reduces the uh, yield uh, risks. All those th things are very good. Now, Van Lau, where Keith has uh, just defined, he was saying biological efficiency. But we economists are saying that ISFM is also optimal in economics, that you get more money when you combine the two. And look, now again move from left to right. This is all zero. They are not applying manure. They are not applying the organic input. Anything, nothing. And then you, you, you retain 100% of the crop residues and you continue all the way to the right. You see the profit for both rice and maize is increasing as you move from left to right. Again, this is something which was done for only Nigeria. And it is only telling us that ISFM is more profitable than the land degrading management practices. Now, we, we tried to compare two, and this is was a study which we did uh, in these countries, Malawi, Uganda, Nigeria, and Kenya. We looked and we compared two management practice. One, which you are applying the recommended rate of 80 kilograms of nitrogen without putting uh, organic inputs. And then we combine that with half of the rate, which is 40 kilograms of nitrogen, but you put 1.7 tons of manure. Now, look at the comparison. In all cases, in all countries, the one that you are combining, manure and uh, uh, inorganic fertilizer at half the rate, recommended rate, is more profitable than the one where you are only applying the recommended rate of 80 kilograms of nitrogen without putting manure. This is very good, and this is, you are not taking into account the, the benefit of uh, the reduction of the, 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 the yield variance. Again, this is something which is very good, telling us that with ISFM, we can reduce the amount of fertilizer by half, which is very good. Now, look at the subsidies. I'm going to talk about the subsidies. They are not subsidizing the organic input. They are only subsidizing one thing, fertilizer. That's it. This is what we call the unholy cross. Why? Because it is illogical. It should not be like this. We looked at, this was across a, a LSM surveys, and we looked at them, and we looked at the adoption rate of ISFM. Now, the strange thing is that ISFM adoption rate, which is in blue histogram, is the lowest. But where the farmers they, who are applying nothing, they are the majority. But look at the profit, which is the orange uh, histogram. It, it, it is the highest here and it will go down as you go this way. 
Now, why this unholy cross? It's unholy because it is illogical. They, it was supposed to, these, uh, uh, these uh, lines were supposed to be actually parallel to each other. All of them rising, but that's not the case. Something is wrong. Why, why, why? This farmer is asking this question. <laughs> now, we also did a study, and this study was very interesting. We went to agricultural extension agents in Nigeria and Uganda. We asked them, what messages do you give to your farmers? The first message was improved seeds. The second one, inorganic fertilizer. The third one was uh, agrochemicals. There was only 1% of the, the extension agents who were saying anything about organic inputs. So the teachers are ignorant. They are not telling the farmers the right thing to do. If they are not talking about the organic inputs, that's something which should be fixed. And we, uh, maybe let, let me go back. There was no one who reported to uh, tell the farmers anything about climate change. Again, the extension agents who are supposed to be educating the farmers need to be educated themselves. They are not, they don't have a clue of what's going on and what should be done. And the, the SFM that we are talking about is something which is not very old. It's a new knowledge. And it is about 30 years old, and before that, there wasn't much talk about that. So the people who went to school 20 years ago need to go back to school. A lot of things have changed. Climate change came, but this is a new thing again. Again, they don't know anything about that. Now, the other problem is this. Aside from the extension agents who don't give the knowledge to the farmers, it's also ISFM is also labor intensive. When you are using manure, the one that we were using, uh, that's, that's also a problem that uh, you have to haul the manure from the, 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 the car at the house and then you to put it to a plot. It requires animals to transport and also uh, it requires a lot of labor. That's something which is a problem and there is a solution to that. Uh, in our analysis, we found that 50% of the cost of production and for us, cost of production includes even the family labor, which they are not paying, but they are, there is an opportunity cost of using your own labor. Uh, we took that into account. 50% of that was accounted for by labor, meaning that ISFM is labor intensive when you are using manure as the organic input that we are talking about. Now, uh, OK, these, these are the results that I was just showing. Um, and we also looked at the, the gender distribution of adoption rate. We found that women are more likely to adopt the organic inputs, but less likely to adopt the, uh, the inorganic fertilizer, for a reason that we know very well because of poverty and other things. Men are more likely to adopt the ISFM and more likely to adopt the inorganic fertilizer alone. Um, <clears throat> There is also lack of public investment into ISFM and organic inputs. And uh, we looked at this fertilizer for these countries, um, Malawi, Zambia, Ghana, Tanzania, and Nigeria. And they are spending quite a lot of money on this. Look at the subsidies. They are quite generous. This is 60 to 80% of the price, almost free, right? And it is also only going to, to, to inorganic fertilizer, nothing about agroforestry or anything like that. So this is a problem that our governments are also ignorant. Our governments, who are supposed to be helping the farmers, they're also ignorant of the benefits uh, that we have for ISFM. So what could be done to increase adoption of uh, ISFM? And uh, these are the things that uh, will be very, very interesting. We did a study uh, in Malawi, which is, has, gives the most generous uh, subsidies. And we wanted to look at the incentives. By the way, I'm an economist, and I don't support uh, subsidies. But I go by Francis, who said that, well, if you can't, God help me to accept things that I can't change and to change things that I can. So even for us economists, I'm now looking at the subsidies that I can't tell the uh, governments in, uh, in Tanzania not to give them. But if they give them, what can they do? And that's something which uh, we did. Uh, in this case, we looked at different, I'm sorry, I'll go back. What we did, we did uh, the, the, the voucher, which is given on the condition that if you have planted agroforest trees, then we are going to give you the voucher. This is something very good, because if they do that, meaning that Malawi now can cut by half the amount of money they are spending on subsidies, 
but still the yields are going to be higher than the yields they are currently giving, but they are only supporting inorganic fertilizer. And we also looked at the rent for insurance and also giving them cash. The results are very interesting. The results show that, first of all, there was no farmer who did not respond to this incentive. All the farmers said, well, if you give me that condition, I'm going to plant the trees. That's very good news. But one thing which was interesting is that, look, compare this, the, 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 the insurance and the subsidy. The majority of the farmers were actually going to this because of their, they, they are used to this uh, subsidy. And that's why you see that there's a lot of them who are choosing that. And uh, the key finding that, that the, the, the farmers were, were responding to all these incentives. And secondly, the cash payment was, uh, was preferred even in the cases where insurance well, the premium from the insurance was better than the cash that so again that's something which is telling us that those, those insurance and all those things they are not yet uh, um, internalized by the farmers they still don't know them so that that's one of the reasons so in conclusion we are saying that uh, ISFM adoption could be increased by looking at uh, offering the short-term training to the agricultural extension agents about ISFM climate change and other new uh, ch new changes and farmers can strongly respond to these incentives. So we can change the subsidy program currently by giving them on condition that the farmers have planted <clears throat> agroforest trees. Now, I talked in the beginning that the ISFM is labor intensive, but agroforest is not as labor intensive as the manure that I'm talking about. You plant the trees on one year, you're done. You're not going to be holding manure again. So. And uh, the studies have been showing that you can cut by more than 50% if you plant what they call the fertilizer trees, the leguminous trees that have fixed a lot of nitrogen. So this is something which is good. That is something that USID, I'm talking to people who influence the policies in, the, in Africa, please pro those people to give the condition, the, the subsidy on the condition that there is some agroforest and all other organic inputs. It's going to be a lot of benefits in terms of reducing the risk, in terms of increasing the yields, and also cutting down the amount of subsidies that they are currently giving. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, let's uh, try this again. Um, we're going to shift gears again. This time we're going to talk about paradigms. We're going to try and do something on the order of uh, 30 or 40 years, 50 years of, of transformation of how we look at the adoption of um, technological practices in agriculture. So it's the, the uh, second phase, the technological change that we're going to talk about here. Um, the first phase was, was um, through, uh, hmm, unlike the first phase, the second phase is perhaps more, more studied. Um, and the study has been framed and shaped and the way we approach and have thought about uh, technological change in agriculture has been shaped by Everett Rogers more than anybody else. He, um, I remember coming in here to USAID back in the 70s and seeing um, his models. Um, it was, it's, it's really, really shaped our mentality and our psyches tremendously. And it, it, it advanced us and advanced him, and we'll see some of his progression through time as well. Um, it was a 1962 book that, that did that. We're going to shift from that perspective to an innovation systems perspective that, that is 21st century. Um, and we're going to do that. We're going to talk about the identity of actors and how our conception of who the actor is and how they're defined, how we characterize them changes. We're going to talk about the dynamics of time. To, to what extent is time um, a, a dimension in all this? And how do actors and innovations change over time? And finally, we're going to talk about innovation and whether innovation is an object or a process. And how though it's through those, considering those three different types of, of uh, factors in the paradigms, um, we'll see how we have, we have evolved over time. It's, this is going to be a necessarily really quick and superficial overview, um, but uh, we'll try and bear with me and then we can talk about it later. 
Um, Rogers Diffusion of Innovations. Um, basically, the actors were identified by cuts underneath the bell curve. Um, we had in innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards. That's how we characterized actors. Um, based on the time frame. Time is only relevant as this passing alters the percentage of the population that has adopted the, the technology. And innovations are um, seen as transferable static objects, unchanging. Um, more dynamic models. Um, they recognize change over time. Um, the, the process that there's been more processes of, of adoption modeled um, in various econometric um, uh, designs um, as well as others. These approaches have emphasized changes occurring over time in learning and in market conditions. They recognize the influence of market networks and the relative market positions and realize that early adopters change the landscape for later adopters. This is not the same situation anymore. Uh, on drawing on agent-based models, technology diffusion could be modeled in a landscape over time. We've got some interesting stuff that's, that's going on that really looks at landscapes and how the different parts of the landscape um, uh, receive a, uh, new, new practices. However, most still assume that the innovation itself does not change. That's that, that, that things are being adopted without adaptation. Adoption, adaptation. Those are the two words we want in our heads, and we want to lose the word. I, I did this at the Soil and Water Conservation Society at the beginning of the, the last phase of, of SANRAM when we went to conservation agriculture. So we want to get rid of that word adoption. Just forget it. Adaptation. That's the word of the 21st century. Over time, we've come to learn about the importance of actor interactions and social learning. This alters our categorization of actors from various classes of adopters to innovators and imitators, those that are performing different roles. So the actor performs roles. It's not just a static thing that is cut off in a percentage of when something happened. Heinrich, um, in 2001, explored this dynamic, arguing that biased cultural transmission was the predominant force for diffusion. And that is copying others who, who are perceived as role models. This could be because of prestige or similarity, charisma. There are a number of different factors that may, may be involved in a particular um, process. Heinrich argues that the purely environmental learning, where decisions are based on something like cost-benefit analysis. You calculate it, you've got it. You've got the answer. And so it creates an R-shaped curve, uh, like you see on the right here. This R-shaped curve um, is, is, is the inflection point is at the beginning. The, the, the rate of, of, of adoption, if you like, the frequency of the trait in the population increases rapidly at the beginning and then levels out. Most situations, however, um, are best expressed by the S-curve over here, which um, is the cumulative density function of the earlier shown bell curve. And th this is because the, 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 there's a long tail at the beginning. Um, there's a slowness of in an initial, initial adoption relative the, to the rate of which individ individuals will imitate previous adopters. And then it accelerates later on if it's going to pass through the entire population or through the population that it passes through. As the frequency of a trait in a population grows, it becomes more valuable. Thus, the prestige of the initial adopter can influence the popularity of an idea or practice. This also pertains to the influence of religious groups on small farmer adoption as well. The social network findings of Granovetter demonstrate that economic behavior is embedded in the network of interpersonal relations. So we're, we're moving from, from the analysis, just a simple um, uh, uh, adoption of innovation, to 
to some other factors, some other learnings that we've learned about the dynamics of uh, interaction and social learning. Um, successful adaptation of innovation practices appears to involve vast networks of relationships that reinforce certain sets of knowledge and beliefs and behaviors and not others. From these agent-based theories and models emerged a perspective where networks of farmers and other stakeholders interact and technological innovation arises from that interaction. Here, the concept of social move, learning moves beyond the idea that our actors are influenced by one another to the notion of stakeholders coming together to collaborate for the purpose of technological or institutional in innovation. This leads to the discussion of a broadened conception of what innovation is. Recognizing that in integrated soil fertility management is a complex technology, we can see the relevance of Rycroft and Cash's work on innovation systems in the 1990s, when we're looking at industries in general and what constitutes innovation. It's huge literature out there to take, take advantage of. And one of the key things that they noted was the con continuous innovation of complex technology can only be carried out by diverse groups and individuals that are parts of communities. Some of the studies move beyond the, uh, the studying of the diffusion of static innovation to the study of the innovation process itself, describing innovation as a reflective and continuous process in which actors seek to maintain equilibrium with their constantly changing environment. They're, may, they're doing contingent decision making. It's not a static moment that you can capture and model at that time as, cha as things change, as climate changes, as the market changes, decision making must adjust and adapt. Sarah and Campbell described the process of innovation in terms of adaptive management and social learning, recognizing that knowledge is a fluid, constantly changing outcome of socio-material relations. Recent work has applied this revised conception of innovation that comprises institutional and organizational change. Okay, in exploring the second phase, we've identified a paradigm shift, which offers new conception of actor identities, time dynamics, innovations, and the relationships between them. There's a greater recognition of the role of actor interaction and social learning. A deeper analysis of time dynamics reveals that as time progresses, innovations themselves are adapted to fit changing needs and conditions. This has led to the shift in the perception of innovation as an unchanging, diffusible object to an ongoing dynamic process. Within these processes, there is not a single moment of individual decision making, rather a continuous process of group negotiation and ad adaptation. So soil management is in, in complex adaptive systems, involves constant adaptation to changing climatic and, uh, conditions and markets. All partners are learning and adapting simultaneously. It's an interacting network and system that's moving forward through time, changing as it moves. We still recognize the farmers as the key actors that we want to focus on, but we take them in their context and the, the, the elements that shape um, their uh, uh, decision making. So how does this innovation system paradigm change our approach to fostering technological change in agriculture? Innovation networks and platforms foster social learning and a collaborative farmer-driven innovation process. They are the forum for negotiation between local and scientific knowledge, which allows innovation to become a result of the negotiation. Innovation networks emerge when different actors realize a mutual desire to improve a project or process. They are composed of farmers, farm organizations, extension, input suppliers, researchers, agencies, policy makers, and many others. Strong networks foster access to knowledge, and physical inputs, increasing farmers' access to options. Strengthening network ties improves the flow of information between local actors. Innovation networks may form organically or be deliberately constructed. 
Innovation platforms are deliberately formed innovation networks. Innovation platforms create an environment that fosters the process of innovation by assembling a variety of stakeholders to identify and resolve systematically interdependent issues in a production network. Essential to innovation platforms is the role of the innovation broker. Innovation brokers are needed to catalyze the process of innovation. A broker is an individual, an organization with a neutral role in the system who fosters collaboration. Innovation brokers are needed to listen, mediate, coordinate various stakeholders. That is to help translate, to help facilitate communication, to make communications competent. Okay. As Ephraim was saying, the extension agents need to go back to school. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. We need to start thinking about what we're, we're talking about in school. I guess the critical thing is that agricultural extension agents are trained in conventional production practices in the first case. That's what Ephraim's point was. And that the way they're taught, the way they're taught science is as a matter of facts that they memorize. The educational system is a memorization system so that science is something that you memorize and then you can tell people forever what it is without it ever changing. Um, this is the core of the, 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 this communication problem. We've got wonderful science of how we can improve soil fertility management. We've got farmers who are doing their best to survive on, with multiple economic demands and, and resources. Um, and we're not, not really talking really well with each other. Um, so we need to, to develop um, agents who are skilled facilitators, negotiators, linguists, translators. What do they need to be doing? They need to be formulating messages to influence stakeholders. Um, and that scientific knowledge needs to be credible, salient, and legitimate. Listening is perhaps the most important skill. We've traditionally favored credibility in science. But is the message salient? Is it relevant? Does it answer a question that, that a farmer has? Is it legitimate or fair? Does it really take them into account and recognize them and what they know um, and, and, and build on that? Serious negotiation activities will involve translation and are required to assure the participation of multiple stakeholders from various um, audiences simultaneously. OK, so local context matters. At the beginning of the presentation, I proposed that small farmer decision making could be analytically differentiated into two phases. The first frames the problem, revealing the local context, local ecology, knowledge, household livelihood strategies, belief systems, networks, leadership, each play a role. These factors, however, do not come together in any universal fashion, replicated from one situation to the next as efforts to scale up technological fixes often assume. In the second phase, I showed how our conception or paradigm of innovation in technological change in agriculture has evolved over the course of since 62. That's over 50 years. Um, this leads to a new understanding of innovation and a transformation in the meaning of adoption to that of adaptation. Because innovation is not simply an individual act, but part of a process of social learning individual, indiv involving a multitude of partners and apt adaptation to changing circumstances, support for building innovation platforms for integrated soil fertility management becomes self-evident. A challenge to implementing this lack is the lack of trained innovation brokers. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Keith and Akram. You fit a lot of great information into your allotted time. Didn't go even one minute over, so excellent job. Um, and now we have about um, half an hour for questions, comments, um, discussion with our presenters from the audience. And uh, we'll alternate between our in-person and our online audience for questions. I see Laura has one right here. Oh, and please um, state your name and organization, if you will. Good morning, Laura Schreg, USAID. Uh, Bureau for Food Security, and thank you so much for the presentation. That was really interesting. So you talked a lot about the need to re-educate extension agents to sort of get integrated soil fertility management um, more accepted and adopted among smallholder farmers. But I'm wondering, um, in you know, the 30 years of work that, that you sort of explored, has this worked? Like, when you educate extension agents, is it more adopted? Like, what do the data say about that? And I asked that question because you really put an emphasis on that, but it seems like there's a lot of value in reframing the question and thinking about if this is a free, if the, you talk a lot about organic matter and it's a free input. So what are the other constraints then? It seems like smallholder farmers could have, should have like, you know, they're smart and they want to get the most out of their effort. So it seems like there are a lot of incentives for them to figure that out and know the value of it already. So I think about like the example in Niger where what it really took was a change in the tree policy. Um, or maybe the, the organic matters just aren't, isn't really available. So even if you educate the extension agents, it might not solve the problem. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I don't think that, that we've seriously address the question of re-education of extension agents. Just uh, that's, uh, the, I'm working currently, Virginia Tech has the in Innovate project that works on education. It was the third of the three of this, this tripartite focus that is, starts bringing back the whole idea of education, research, and outreach in agriculture to USAID. I mean, this is, this is a big movement that's just restarted at USAID, huh? Um, and it, the education one, the Innovate, was the last of them. We don't find a lot of support amongst the missions um, to, to support agricultural education. But the essence of it is, if you've ever really been out there with, with farmers and extension agents, you can see and feel the gap between them. They tell that the extension agent has an education, has higher status, and does not accept the value of, of the farmer and what the farmer has to say and brings to the table. That, 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 that gap is enormous. And what we've done is we've, tr we've got educational systems uh, throughout Africa, throughout the world, but particularly in Africa, that is really based on memorization of facts. And we're telling them that's science. We're telling them from our programs back here that they're doing that and, and the, 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 the system of education is to read notes that they, they got from their professor 30, 40 years ago. That's so that, that it's a memorization system that's going on. We have to address that at the heart of the communication system. Science is not memorized facts, no matter how good those particular facts may be in a particular circumstance. It is an approach to, to investigation um, and, and its discovery and testing of hypotheses. And that's, that's where we need to, to be addressing things to, to transform whether the, the, the uptake of really good ideas that, that, that soil scientists have about how the soil works. But they've got to be communicated and translated to the farming population. And currently, we're, we're, we don't have the, the types of people to do that. Thank you. I think I'd agree with, with all the points that you just made. So maybe I didn't rephrase my question quite right. I guess my question is, if you, if you did the experiment where you educated the extension agents on integrated soil fertility management, and then they went out and you had a control group where they weren't educated, would you see much higher adoption of integrated soil fertility management? Or would you not see very high adoption? And is that more likely due to issues with policy and sort of the lack of the inputs that are necessary for the, for the uptake of these great practices that you're recommending? Short answer is that if we did, we do this, trans, this, this experiment that you suggest, um, 
we could then actually test the policies in a, in a, uh, with, with, with a, an environment that was better controlled. Maybe let me add some yeah. few few lines. Uh, you 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 talked very well about this memorization and stuff like that. There is also okay. There is also a new approach to extension services. By the way, the the word extension services is a one way uh, approach uh, that uh, there is a teacher and a student, and the new approach is the two way. Uh, advisory services where there is learning from both the farmers themselves and the extension agents. And this one is that they are calling it advisory services. Now, and we come very close to your, 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 your paradigm, which is very interesting that when you go to the farmers, you are going to be learning a lot of things. They are, have a lot of things that they know about the environment that the extension agents didn't read in the books. Now, we did, it wasn't an experiment that you are talking about about extension agents. Uh, when we asked them the messages they give to the farmers, the following question was uh, actually related to this ISFM, climate change, and all those things, about their knowledge and all that. They didn't know. <laughs> That's the unfortunate thing. So had they known that, they, they, they would have uh, talked about it with the farmers. But now it happened that they didn't know. Then we asked the farmers, where do you get the, ex I mean, uh, knowledge about uh, climate change and all that. They said the radio. I know what they get from the radio is the weather tomorrow. It is not about the climate change that we are talking about. So there is a knowledge problem. And when it is addressed, I believe that it's going to address partly this problem. You also cited the, the, the Niger case. This is my baby. I mean, it, the government didn't invest anything, but it provided incentive for the farmers to protect trees and plant trees. It happened. We saw the regreening of the Sahel. So it, it doesn't begin and stop at the extension. It also goes to the institutional changes that are also required to have this done. Um, I can see there are lots of in-person responses to this, but we also want to make sure we throw it to our online audience. So we'll go there first and then come back here. Yeah, we've had a pretty lively discussion online with 120 people joining us for today's webinar. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around agroforestry. And uh, one of the first questions is, we have Rashid Siraj. Uh, would like to know, are there resources and or evidence for how integrated soil fertility management or agroforestry overcomes the labor constraints? And to kind of tack onto that, Woody Navin, a USA advisor, was uh, particularly concerned about factoring in labor cost for planting uh, agroforestry trees. Um, I, I don't have anything particular. You, you address that okay. first. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, th th this is very good. Uh, the, the agroforestry, it, I, I believe it doesn't have a lot. Planting a tree, it doesn't take a long time to do that. You can do it in one, in one day. But getting the seeds, there is also a problem of market of the agroforest. Uh, 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 planting materials, that the, the, that's something which is a, a bigger constraint than the, the problem of, of labor. You plant it and the, those are trees that they take a while, about, about three years before you can even see the returns to those agroforest trees. At the beginning, they can take away part of your land and you're not going to see the benefits maybe for about three years. So there is also an, a need to be providing incentives to, for the farmers to be able to plant those trees and wait for about three years before they can uh, they, they can uh, they can benefit from that, and that's why I think there is a need of having these uh, incentives that they can be provided so that they can be able to uh, to, to to invest in the in the agroforest trees. So the short answer is, agroforest does not have a very serious labor problem because you plant the trees is there. You are not going to be planting every year, but there is the problem of long term investment that is required. At the big first, first three years, you may not see the benefits of planting those trees, but you're going to see those benefits maybe three years after. OK, a great question to add on to that would be um, Mary Allen from Practical Action wants to know how many years do the planted trees need to survive to get those cash vouchers? Oh, no. The survival rate, again, it depends on the areas where you're planting the trees. For example, the Sahelian region that Laura talked about, 
the, 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 we, in our study that we saw, the, the survival of the trees was low, but in areas which are humid and subhumid, the survival rate is quite high if you keep the animals away. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to our in-person. Um, here, I'll get next. Um, I'm Suzanne Pola from USAID, the Bureau of Food Security. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments. First of all, I agree with a lot of the, the things you said about needing for um, re-education or um, in-service, maybe, for a lot of extension agents. I happen to be the AOR for the Modernizing Extension Advisory Services, which is the uh, companion for the Innovate, which works with extension agents. And the Ag Innovation Systems paradigm is exactly what is being promoted. And um, uh, MIAS is coming up with a, um, a through our one of the consortium members, Catholic Relief Services, a group of, of pocket guides for extension agents to learn about how do you work with farmers in terms of adapting to climate change? So this is on the radar screen and something that's coming up. I also would like to uh, go back to my personal experience um, in terms of US adoption of soil conservation and other things. I think uh, Laura's point, again, if you look at, um, you know, in the 60s and the monoculture, uh, fence row to fence row, corn and soybeans, and some of the uh, soil conservation service, not just extension agents, but the U.S. had a soil conservation system with agents out there working with farmers to adopt uh, co soil conservation plans and watershed management. I know even to this day in our family farm in Iowa, my father was one of the first, he was a soil conservation and one of the first to adopt the terracing, watershed management, the grassed waterways, all of the other good practices, and no-till. Uh, still one of the few in the watershed with those innovations. So I don't think it's just a matter of the extension agents. Um, Keith has a quick reply. I, I, I think that I, I probably miss spoken to some extent by just talking extension agent. Um, everything we said, I think, is, is relevant to extension agent. But what I'm, what I'm talking about are innovation brokers. And that's a broader category. The extension agents are a real big, important part. And I'm, I'm really happy with what, what Mies is doing with, with that. Um, we need to do more. Um, but I worry about the U.S. example. The history of extension and the land-grant system in the United States. If you look at back when it really got set up, it was really the sons and daughters of, of the farmers who went off to that local state college or university, that land-grant school, and came back to help their parents' generation farm and then take over the farm themselves. They, they were the same people. They, they were integrated into the rural environment and they talked the same language. Status differentials were not existing to anywhere near the state, particularly in Iowa, the, one of the most uh, homogenous states in, in, in the union and maybe in the world. Um, but it, a lot of leaders came out of uh, Iowa nationally for all sorts of things. So it's a really good thing. The Jeffersonian idea is not bad at all. The problem in, 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 in developing countries with small holders is that they are not monocropping farmers. Number one, the, 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 the economic basis and the economic decision making that all these wonderful models tell us about assumes that framework. And that's got to be, be a, thought through a lot more carefully. And a lot of the modeling does try and take that into account. But it's really tough modeling because you're, you're trying to objectify a lot of things that, that are contingent decisions on the part of a smallholder, man or woman, um, who's managing their part of the household. Um, and, and so that, that it's not the, the, the same dynamic that's, that's going on. That, that, that you, the decision making that farmers make in the United States to adopt these practices, although it, it's been challenging too, 
um, is in the context of a mono farming. The other thing I want to come back to real quickly, and then I'll just stop talking for a while, um, is that the network I'm talking about is highly inclusive. We're talking about those policymakers too. There's a good article that came out. I um, uh, can't remember. I think in uh, uh, the American, no, no, the uh, Association of uh, Extension edu Agriculture Education and Extension, um, back last year or so. Um, but anyways, it talks about three different networks that are really critical. There's the, the local network amongst the farmers. There's a horizontal network that, that scales out the, the, the technology. And then there's a vertical network that works on the policy and linkages to the, the higher levels uh, uh, generalize uh, of the system. And that the, the people involved in those three networks are not necessarily the same. Unfortunately, the research is based on an, uh, a Dutch example, um, so it may not be quite as appropriate. But uh, the idea that there are different networks, components that need to be managed, that it's not just at the farm level um, and the farmers that we need to focus on. Speakers or any participants point to references on multi-location, multi-year studies on the profitability of integrated soil fertility management and smallholder systems. I guess if not like a specific study, any examples? Uh, the study that we did it covered several countries, and uh, we are currently doing a study which is uh, covering the whole globe the economics of land degradation. And uh, this, the, we did in Bhutan, we did in uh, in uh, Uzbekistan, quite a number of countries. We have 11 case study countries. In all the studies, the results are quite uh, the same. So uh, one can, uh, can send a, a site to the, this study that uh, is coming. We're going to publish a book uh, in the middle of this year. Uh, it's going to come out, and it's going to be published by Springer. All the case studies, that uh, we do have them in that, in that book. So I'll, I point out to the, 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 the link to, to this uh, study that we're doing. Um, and along similar lines, um, if, if you are aware of any uh, really useful resources, um, I forgot to put up the contact information. Um, anything you'd like to highlight through our agrilinks.org platform about soils or about uh, ISFM or farm behavior change, uh, you can feel free to email agrilinks at agrilinks.org or email me and we'll make sure that it gets uh, disseminated to our audience. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you for the presentations. My name is Michael Ketover. Um, I've had the privilege and the heartburn of managing the Resiliency in Northern Ghana program for the last two years. And um, it's not an agriculture focus, but it's Feed the Future funded. I've got three quick comments, please. Um, first of all, um, I think every year should be a year of the soil, so I just want to put my bias on the table. And uh, that's based on uh, the data and my own, uh, my own perceptions of what's worked in the field, working at the field level. Um, I was uh, a bit bemused by the lack of focus on green manures, the Dolico Lab Lab, the Makuna, um, that actually uh, produce the biomass that we're really looking for. I think the manure limitation is something that we know. And um, we've had good experiences, especially in Central America with the green manures. Um, managing it is another issue, but they can certainly produce the biomass, one. Number two, um, with RING, we are training ag extension agents, and it's a modest component, on um, you know, soil improvement before we give them the improved seeds. And uh, that's a slow process, and we're working with the poorest of the poor, but we're also look, working on the way that the uh, agents are interacting with their clients, uh, more of the supportive supervision and um, we agree that they just don't have any concept of soil improvement. And we can uh, we have an opportunity there. And the third thing is I went to a BFS Feed the Future conference in Senegal when I, uh, a couple of years ago. And for the five days, there was virtually no mention of um, soil improvement, soil conservation. The focus, as we know, is on seeds and on, um, and on the other inputs. And I don't think any of us in this room are anti uh, chemical fertilizer, but throwing it on organic soil that's rich, we know produces a better product. So of the 500 plus indicators that Feed the Future ha is uh, sharing with us, one would hope that there could be a stronger emphasis on this topic. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. 
Um, all right, I think we, we'll throw it back to our online audience, and then I'll come back over here. OK, this question is from Elizabeth Dunn, uh, directed towards Dr. Moore. Uh, would you please talk a bit more about innovation brokers? Do you articulate them as external actors? Um, innovation brokers. Uh, innovation brokers are someone who has an opportunity to, to bring people together. Um, and this is most important at the uh, local level, um, but they operate at all levels. Uh, the, the, the social innovation people are, are, are good at this at multiple levels. What it needs to be, is, it could be an extension agent. It could be an NGO leader. It could, it's, it's that champion that, you know, many of you have run into somewhere or other. They have to be a little bit selfless um, because they've got to be perceived as neutral. Because when they're not perceived as neutral, whatever they come from or whatever their agenda is, according to how the locals see it, um, uh, will be seen and calculated into the way they're reacted to. Um, so innovation brokers need facilitation skills. They, 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 it's the soft skills that we're learning more and more are required to do any job in the modern knowledge society. And what we're talking with a to complex technology like integrated soil fertility management is a knowledge society type of technology. It's complex. It requires information, requires many different partners to be able to do this. The innovation broker is the one who can translate, who can move between different groups and find ways to bring them together um, at the table. Um, there's the, the idea of, of someone who, who knows how to hold dinners. In fact, uh, in the book that, that Jerry brought, um, we have a chapter on just how do you hold a dinner and how do you invite everyone into that. Um, Jerry had a couple of follow-up comments. Yeah, just a response. Uh, I appreciate your comments, and uh, the Ring Project is, is a great project in northern Ghana. But these issues, these complex issues uh, of soil fertility management are challenging in, a, in both, from both the domestic uh, political landscape, so to speak, and, and even with national governments. I think it's so much easier for people to grasp the idea of fertilizer and seeds. And so we often, th th that more industrial approach is often emphasized because it's just very difficult oftentimes to convey how we're going to scale up or scale out widen the adoption of integrated soil fertility management. I mean, it, it's, it, I think that's one of the reasons that we see this. Uh, initially, when I came in, I often wondered, well, you know, this seems like a predominantly industrial approach that's often promoted. But yet, when you talk to people individually within USA, they, uh, they acknowledge and appreciate uh, the concerns that you raised about soil not being uh, raised high enough. And I agree. It's not a it's not a commodity. It's not part of it. It's not seen as part of the value chain. It's much more difficult. You know, it, it goes beyond people's preference for what they want to see and, and more how things are communicated. Oftentimes, it's not always the case. But anyway, it's a it's a challenging topic, um, which may lead into the innovation platform idea that we are widely adopting in our more systems type of research. And you talked about these different networks of people, horizontal, vertical, uh, all over the place. And I do think that that's a very interactive, it seems like, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, it's a very interactive process to get away from this one-way interaction between extension agents and farmers. And the additional problem is not just having extension agents go back and maybe update their learning, but just having extension agents at all or extension agents with resources to reach the farmers. So putting these innovation platforms together that focuses on enabling, empowering extension agents and have bringing them in with farmers on an equal footing rather than on a, you know, a, a teacher-student type of basis, I think 
I, I'm hopeful. Uh, so I'm wondering, from your perspective, Keith, uh, in, in terms of the scale of innovation platforms, does it need to be very local, regional? I mean, are there national in, in innovation platforms? Or, or, you know, what's the direction there? In, in innovation platforms, um, it's, a, it's a really catchy. Yeah. Um, and they're at all levels. Uh, and, and, and indeed, they should be. You need national innovation. You need people coming together to discuss these policy options and doing the research that is, is broader based to see what, what are the incentive systems that are going to kick in best. Um, you need, and th this is the, the question that you asked earlier about will uh, ISFM really be the thing that's adopted if you a actually set up an innovation network uh, 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 platform at the local level? Maybe not, actually. Because maybe in the discussions between the farmers and uh, the innovation brokers and their local market connections in input suppliers, they find out something else is really the problem that needs to be solved. And if you don't solve that problem, you're never going to get to the next one. Um, and when we come in from the outside with our solution, it may not be the problem that is relevant that needs to be solved. And the, so that the, the importance of this it's, there is, we've got to have the messages on in, integrated soil fertility management, emphasize the soil. That's got to be one of the key roles that's brought to the table in these innovation platforms, that expertise. But it has to be done by listening to where it's relevant and how you're going to get there from here. Not how you're just going to get there, but how are you going to get there from here? And that's around the table that that discussion occurs. Um, Sanram. Uh, S-A-N-R-E-M um, is, uh, you put that into your, your search engine and you'll find the Sanrem uh, website and it has quite a bit of references. The last um, fa five year phase was on conservation agriculture. There were uh, projects in seven countries around the world. You've got some of the comparative work that's done there um, to, to take a look at for those who are looking for those references. Okay. Since today, we have about six or seven minutes left, um, but we'll try and squeeze in as many as we can. And feel free to stick around for additional networking. <coughs> Hi, Kurt Reinsman, BFS. I uh, particularly appreciate this discussion and thank Laura for kicking off uh, a lot of these questions and uh, appreciate the understanding of the complexities of the household decision making process that goes into all of this. Um, it, it just occurs to me that. Uh, Getting the message right and bolstering or uh, retraining public sector extension services may indeed be helpful, but to the extent that the basic incentive structure for those agents themselves is a problem, lack of resources, lack of incentives, lack of accountability, all of those sorts of things. I'm just wondering, in your experience, have you ever had the opportunity to compare private company delivered extension services vis-a-vis -vis public sector uh, extension services. And I'm not, uh, where the incentive structure might be different for the agents themselves. And I'm not advocating that we abandon public sector extension by any means. So just that caveat. I, I think that the work on that, and that latter question, um, a comparison of public and private extension services, to make it simple, um, can be elaborated in a lot of different ways. I don't know of any particular studies as such, and then I've not studied that in particular. Um, but what I've seen and heard is that certainly, it, certainly I've seen with the NGOs, they are much more motivated when they're paid better. Um, they have some of the similar types of top-down sort of perspectives, and that's where we need to, to work on, on that attitude. But the motivations, the incentive systems are, are superior. The problem is systemic, though. To what extent can we afford to finance these externally supported? I mean, the NGO, the, the private sector, if the private sector is self-supporting locally, we've got it made. That's the... That, that's the the real solution. There's lots of, of things to work out. Um, there's lots of, of uh, 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 
interpersonal relationships in developing those the networks and strong innovation systems within that because each each of the partners are going to come to the table trying to improve their own situation um, and that's reasonable um, and that's part of the reason to have a broker in, in, in sorting that out um, but then that's 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 sustainable the 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 difficulty is that governments have not been able to sustain extension services at any level huh I mean it's they just sort of disappeared some countries still have extension services but basically it's un unsupportable private sector has moved in and that's part of why you sell seeds because there's a value added that you can you can start to pay for these extra services what a lot of the marketing the value chain stuff seems to be finding though is that when you pull out that middleman the 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 value chain can collapse very quickly and so um, it, to the extent that we're setting up projects in ways that the middleman is a, is, is a project supported private sector middleman, um, we're in trouble. It's got to be articulated into the system where, where the system is paying for it. Um, putting in uh, uh, um, uh, intermediaries that are project supported, that uh, are sunsetted at the end of, of the, um, the project, is, it's just not sustainable. And and where is the line? How do you how do you create that? That's that's some of the the, the devils in the details of doing that. But that's that's certainly one of the the issue areas that we need to be exploring with our projects. Let me add mm -hmm. a point. Uh, we we did a study in Uganda and Nigeria again again extension agents and we were looking at the incentives and the affiliation of the extension agents and we found out the extension agents are affiliated with the government. We are offering more traditional knowledge, I extend them it is improved seeds and all that, but the ones associated with NGOs, we are uh, giving more messages about the environment and other things at ISFM. The interesting thing was this, we also compared the incentive, uh, how are the extension agents motivated, and we compared men extension agents and female extension agents. Guess what? Women were more incentivized to work, even though their resources they have, the amount of wear time they have, uh, the motorbikes and all that, we are less than the men. So, so it's very interesting. So if you want in, in I mean, investing to women extension agents, they are more effective than the men extension agents. I, I, I want to just second that on a study in Senegal that we, we conducted years ago and found indeed that that's, that's the case. The messages that went through, there weren't that many women extension agents, but those that were, they went to the women, they got to the household. The men and women in the, those households that were served by uh, women extension agents were much better informed than those um, uh, served only by male extension agents. We'll cap it off with a, uh, an online question and then wrap up. Okay. Yeah, the, the conversation online has been uh, really great. We have a lot of questions pouring in from all over the world. Uh, of course, we're not going to have time to answer all of the questions, so maybe, not making promises, at some point we can email the questions to the speaker and ask for feedback. Um, but this last one's from Gital Maburi from World Vision DC. Apologize if I mispronounce the name. Um, it's for Ephraim. Did the study find that farmers who apply ISFM understand the importance of getting the mix right? Uh, for example, balancing the ratio of organic versus inorganic fertilizers? Where they, they did, and uh, in this case, we were looking at uh, how much they, they, they apply. Uh, we, were, we found that the application rate of uh, both the organic and inorganic fertilizer were less than the recommended rates. Uh, but again, that's understandable. The ones who were applying uh, the organic inputs were more likely to have livestock than the ones who don't. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the, the inorganic, in, inorganic fertilizer, the rates that they were, they were applying were, were, was less. But in terms of knowledge, I think there were a lot more knowledge about the farmers who we are uh, applying SFM. They were likely to be closer to the market and also to have uh, access to other resources of information educated in marketing aspects. Right. We have the final closing comment that I'll send over to Moffat for metrics. Hi, my name is Moffat Gugi with the Bureau for Food Security, Climate Change and Environment uh, Portfolio. I, I wanted to top off basically on the metrics question. This is a, th a thing we've really struggled with. When you think of uh, sort of a, a integrated soil fertility management as well as a lot of NRM and climate change kinds of metrics, 
we've really struggled with this. We tried at the beginning to incorporate those things and we, we couldn't quite get it. Missions really came back saying this is very difficult to track and so on. So I want to encourage all our online as, uh, participants as well as everybody here, if you have good ideas on metrics and so on, please engage with us. I think this is a discussion that's ongoing. We know the focus that's going to be happening on climate smart agriculture and so on. So we want to be able to, to see what has worked output indicators, sort of uh, impact indicators, uh, uh, as well as uh, out, uh, sort of um, output Im impact and uh, uh, impact. Eh? So all at whatever level, please uh, engage with us on AgriLinks and other venues so that uh, we see where we go with this. Thank you. Thank you, Malfat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all questions, but we hope that the speakers will follow up um, as needed. I really appreciate all of your attendance. Uh, thank you on behalf of Feed the Future, BFS, and the KDAD project. We'll see you for our next seminar.